Hello, uh, my name is Hanna Reislien. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I should uh, introduce myself briefly. I am an advisor now to the Major General of the Cyber Defence Forces and a senior researcher there, there as well. We have just established a digitalization innovation research unit, actually, so I'm part of that one. And uh, being part of the military, uh, I have to say that um, um, it would have been interesting if we had anyone from the military sector, actually, of some, some armed army personnel to talk about the headline of this whole seminar, which is cyber defense. Uh, and so I sit here and feel a little bit alienated uh, uh, when it comes to the heading of the seminar and, and also the discussions and the topics uh, that have been raised. That being said, of course, it's been very interesting to listen to you, but I would really like to get a little bit back to what the heading of the seminar says that this is about, which is cyber defense. Um, and I think it's been interesting also to, um, when I'm sitting here, you know, working for the military and would deal with cyber defense every day, um, how uh, different we all approach it. Uh, cyber defense has become, seems that it's, it's a, I don't know, a jar of cyber security, uh, some civil actions, some, some online internet things. It's a very broad, um, it's at least the way we tend to talk about this in, in public, it's, we approach it in a very broad and general way, bouncing between some kind of public affairs, public education, something, and also very in-depth technological um, insights. But so, I'd like to really approach the panel just by saying so, uh, to ask you more about, like, if you could connect your talks more into the cyber, to the cyber defense heading. Uh, I thought it was particularly interesting, uh, both uh, with you there, oh, sorry, I can't remember all the names at once. Uh, when you talked about the measures that you've take, taken, um, you said that there are a lot of things you've done, done over the past few years. Um, but one thing is to, to have processes and to have, you know, implement measures. But I keep, but you also mentioned things like there is, um, uh, you have that uh, challenge of, for example, when, when um, there was this virus and people open it on their phones. And that that's, was a good thing as it's in, in terms of cyber defense. Uh, so, because uh, the virus was meant for computers, apparently. I thought that was a very interesting example of how the uh, civil sphere and civil sector is actually part of the whole cyber defense. Could you say something more about that? Uh, yes, I think, and I mentioned that the civil military cooperation is a very important issue. Maybe I didn't elaborate enough on it. Uh, what we saw is that basically if uh, you have a military networks, so they're very well protected. Usually they're separated, they're well protected, secure. And if we have a military people protecting only military networks. So I think we would miss one of the elements that in the time of crisis and in the time of war, there would be certain critical infrastructure that would still need to be protected. So our approach is that we take these military people and bring them into our National Cybersecurity Center to work together with the civilians on day-to-day -day threats, both in the government networks and the critical infrastructure, so they see real examples, day-to-day examples, and if the need comes, they would be familiar with the critical infrastructure. They would be able to protect it. And I think this is what we see more and more in many countries. Because the military networks, I would say, is really now built very, like a bulletproof. And they would be used in the time of war mainly. But the critical infrastructure part is becoming more and more vital to the function of a state. And we have to kind of bring closer military and use this resource so they would have uh, peacetime tasks on protecting critical infrastructure. 
so they would be able to address the wartime task when, uh, when the need comes. And only also civilians would be more familiar with the, uh, the whole process and they would be able to more easily, for example, to integrate uh, to some task if there is mobilization going on. So this is kind of our approach. That's what we, where we are driving our military civil cooperation. And very important moment, again, is the SPESCO project, creation of rapid response teams, both nationally and then internationally. Because nationally, we also, we are striving to form these teams on a military level, but also incorporating some civil elements. And I think this is, this is the way to go. Thank you. I have one more question to the panelists before I open up for questions there. So uh, just prepare, be prepared. Um, I'm, uh, I want to go over to our American panelists there. I, um, I just came to think of something. I, I'm part of a think tank at the US Naval War College. And um, we had a dinner there it's about a year and a half ago. And I was sitting beside someone who was working in the White House. And he, I asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, my task will be, job will be to try to keep the president away from Twitter. I think he completely failed. <laughs> like I, now I heard he's unemployed. Um, but anyway, it's, it's something very interesting you said also about trust. Because um, the, um, the way that the U.S. approaches cyber defense is quite different from uh, many of the, the Scan um, European models. So you've been militarizing the domain in a way with, with the establishment of the cyber command. Um, but still, it's also to going back to, your, to what you mentioned as well, that the issue of trust, uh, I'm, I'm pointing out Lisna here in the front, that the issue of trust is uh, key to and it's really a big part of any kind of security measure when you try to include the civil society. You need, and, and if, I'd say for any democracy even to work, you need trust from the civil population towards, for example, the military. I've been working in the Middle East for... Uh, decades and um, have you seen uh, the issue of trust towards uh, public uh, institutions in the Middle East compared to the US? Fascinating. In the Middle East uh, you would be uh, the public trust towards public institutions, particularly the military and the police would be between th three to seven percent. In Norway it's about, about 90. Uh, so good luck with that. But I've seen when you, when you talk about trust and trying to um, engage also uh, uh, the civil society, um, one of the things that you see in the U.S. now is that the public trust towards, uh, uh, I'd say, towards the government and many governmental institutions is sinking. Um, how do you think that affects your cyber defense efforts? Uh, great question, an excellent point about both the United States and uh, the Middle East, um, many countries in the Middle East. Yeah, trust in institutions is um, key not only to the, uh, the, the human aspect of cyber defense, but it's also key to maintaining your democracy. Uh, trust in institutions uh, can lead to trust in electoral integrity, for example. So um, something that, that we were discussing uh, last night. Uh, if, if I have a, uh, a digital elections system and I harden it so that it is unhackable, my adversary may very well not bother trying to hack it. That would be incredibly expensive. Rather, they might spread disinformation to say, oh, it was hacked and your vote was misinterpreted. And especially circulate that disinformation among the, the, political, the folks who are part of the political party that lost or parties. Uh, and perhaps that would have just as great a detrimental effect on faith in democracy as actually going through the trouble of hacking the system. Uh, I believe they're going to go for the low-hanging fruit. So wherever there's mistrust in institutions, uh, they're going to exploit those. And creating mistrust in institutions is, is a, in it, it's not an end in itself, but it's very close to one because it creates a vulnerability that you can get, then come back to. It's a real challenge for the United States right now. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, the latest data shows that the U.S. military is still trusted than most of our other institutions, so they, we have some faith in them. Um, uh, uh, there's some real divides, though, uh, in terms of the left and the right on that particular subject. Uh, and when you can make, when you can tie trust or distrust in institutions to group identity, then 
that's a real vulnerability. So if I can make trust in the banking system part and parcel to being a Republican, that means that I can then target the left with distrust in the banking system and actually threaten uh, the U.S. financial system. Uh, so it is, it's a very big deal and I think that it's been uh, severely under addressed and sometimes internally exacerbated in my country. All right, so uh, enough of my questions. Can we open up from, uh, I'm sure there are questions from the floor. Yes, you want to start? Thank you very much. Um, fascinating uh, listening to you uh, talking about these this, uh, digital influence operation challenges that we, that we face. And uh, my, my question is, I suppose, mostly to, to Jed and uh, Marco. Um, I think you, you very succinctly identified the challenge that we face, these, these actors that are operating in the cyberspace on Facebook, on Twitter, creating, um, creating a lot of attention around ideas that are not necessarily as popular as they appear on cyberspace. My question is, what do we do about it? And how do we address it? I mean, you, you've identified the problem, but and particularly, what role does the government and the military sector have in dealing with this? Should they get closely involved and work more closely with the private sector to address this? And should we have teams of specialists and maybe AIs working to delete bots and so forth? So that's my question. Thank you. Um. Thank you, and, and you can't guess how much I hope that you did not ask that question, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really the core of the problem. First, we are living in a, wor in a, in a world where free speech is, is uh, one of the most important values. And, and whatever we do in that field, we must be very, very careful of not limiting people's right to express their opinions. And as you know, that, that uh, even so some sometimes very crazy bursts of opinion are, are well, well, all within the limits of, of freedom of, of speech. Um, I've been dealing with that matter when I was with the, with the Prime Minister of Finland uh, for a number of years, and I'm convinced that there is uh, no tactical solution for, for the problem. It, it must be a comprehensive approach, uh, a strategy. Uh, we, of course, we need, uh, let's say, examples uh, of, of lies and disinformation and, and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. But we, I would be very careful in creating ta task forces that hunt down, well, government task forces that hunt down uh, fake news, because that might easily be interpreted as, as the uh, censorship or something like that. We need examples, of course. But, but I, I would concentrate on, on two main issues, and, and they are, well, in, in, in the Nordic countries we, we don't have that problem because we, we have well-educated people and, and in, in, in all, all Scandinavian countries. I, that is my judgment. And I have always said that, that the first line of defense here is primary school and good, good primary school teacher to make sure that, that the youngsters, they are, you know, they know what they come from and what is their identity. Second thing I'm a bit worried about is, is uh, media, uh, quality media. And uh, well, that is doing very bad in, uh, in Europe as a whole. And uh, the readership is down and uh, advertisers do not spend that much money uh, uh, doing their business with uh, the traditional media anymore. So um, I think that we should figure out some let's say, well, way to support uh, quality media. But again, that is a bit problematic if the government gives money to uh, free media. But, I, I, uh, but, you know, I just can't see uh, uh, quality media in countries like Finland, Norway, Sweden survive very long without some sort of support. Um. And I will, I will echo you uh, in uh, the uh, emphasis on uh, identity and helping uh, uh, especially young people develop an identity that, that makes them feel a part of the society and the importance of, of quality media, whether that's uh, public media, private media, or both. Um, 
uh, I agree that the solution is not going to be uh, technological exclusively, although technology is a big part of the solution. Um, it's part of the larger cyber defense solution, uh, and it's also part of the, the information and operations solution. Uh, uh, in terms of practicalities, uh, I don't want to use up everyone's time, uh, but I break it out into four areas. Uh, Technology is one. Uh, awareness, probably the most important one, is another. Just driving awareness of these are the places where the adversary senses our vulnerabilities, so just be aware of that rather than tackling the specific fake stories. The broad areas, you gotta build awareness there. Uh, coordination, so coordination uh, intra-government um, uh, and also inter-government, um, especially when you're dealing with small nations. Uh, and coordination is, is both about sharing, these are the memes that are out there, these are the, this is the fake news that's out there, these are the bots that are out there, but it's also about understanding the positive influencers and the positive memes and the positive uh, notions that are out there so that we can, uh, uh, we can amplify those and tap into each other's networks of influences because different audiences are gonna respond to, uh, to different folks as messengers. Um, on education, I'm just going to throw this out there. It's controversial. Um, I, I, Education is essential to establishing identity. I don't think media literacy tra training and uh, critical thinking skills are the solution to this particular problem. They're a solution to a lot of problems, to making individuals uh, better participants in a democracy, to making them better citizens, to strengthening the economy. But when it comes to countering foreign disinformation efforts, especially those that have to do with foreign policy, I don't think it's effective um, I, well, I don't think it's a silver bullet. All right, now I'm gonna go way out there. I don't think it's a silver bullet because of issues of salience. And salience is, do people care enough to tap into those critical thinking skills no matter how strong they are? I, I've, 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 I'm really lucky I've had a decent education. I think I've got some okay critical thinking skills. I'm certainly uh, a skeptical uh, of a lot of things. Um, but if Let's say, hypothetically, and I know this isn't happening, it may never happen, but hopefully it will, that there's a uh, championship hockey game between Norway and Sweden. And for some reason, I'm curious about the score of this game. I pick up my phone, I write in Norway, Sweden. Game's ongoing, so first thing that pops up is the score. Great, I put my phone down. I don't check my source, I don't double check that score, I don't even look what my source is. Uh, it could easily be a bot or a hacker or someone who's making bets on the game, a big, big criminal institution making bets on the match. And the reason why I don't check is because I don't care about hockey. I mean, no offense, but I really don't care. I care about hockey about as much as your average German citizen cares about the geopolitical significance of Nord Stream. And I'll stop there. Just a moment, we have someone waiting there first. Uh, yeah, I, I think that a lot of uh, valid points were touched, uh, touched upon here and really development of critical thinking and checking the sources, but I fully agree that the normal person, I mean on a normal day, he doesn't check every day the sources. But also we should not see like kind of a, the adversaries that want to influence us as kind of have unsurmountable resources, power, and so on, and we so so weak and we cannot do nothing. So I think every bit counts developing critical thinking, technical measures. I can, for example, mention one where we use the artificial intelligence to uh, uh, find the fake news. It's called the debunk.eu that uses uh, kind of a special search algorithm developed by the private uh, media companies that checks, uh, for example, if there are pictures, the same pictures uh, as you show, somewhere on the other uh, sites, and then they just indicate. They say, okay, this, this uh, tweet, this uh, Facebook post is suspicious. I mean, you have to check it. I mean, it might not be genuine. So people who want can check it. So, and integrating most technical uh, uh, kind of tools with the critical thinking, I think at some point would create the synergy and help us at least move upon, uh, move towards the goal. There's no silver bullet, but we have, but it's not a uh, justification not to do anything. Okay, and the last question from, no comment from the panel. Yeah, well, one, one short, short comment here um, regarding the, uh, Resilience. Uh, it should be bear in mind that uh, 
uh, disinformation operations, uh, they, they might last long. Uh, we don't speak about days, weeks, they, they, might, they might last years, even decade. And uh, that is important to bear in mind. Uh, just to give you one example, a very short one. Uh, let's assume that you have a 15-year-old schoolboy at home who is tasked, tasked by his teacher to write a piece on, on Ukrainian crisis. What, what the guide does first? Googles, right? And, and uh, uh, he ra runs into a number of fabricated documents, false information that is put there on purpose. And, and the, the whole intention of this operation is that uh, bit by bit, uh, false information f finds its way to school books, news articles, even PhDs, and, and they uh, change the perception of the world. And, and, and that's why uh, when we look at uh, disinformation campaigns, uh, we, uh, it, we should really r remember that they, they last long, and, and, and that's why a uh, very you know, comprehensive approach, from my point of view, is, is important. And then we have one more question there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gudrun Sefru. I work for the Norwegian Defense Material Agency. Um, um, as to the um, liberalism of Western society uh, and our emphasis on free speech, is not that uh, a bit of a Achilles heel in concert with um, with the social media, where everybody has a say, and everybody can say whatever they want to, without any um, retaliation from anyone. So, would censorship or personal de personal identities for the users would that be a solution? Part of the solution of the problem, that if you want to log on to uh, Facebook or Twitter or the others. You have um, the system has to know who you are. Did you hear me? You get me out of focus. So I suppose in the long, long term, just to follow, on, uh, follow up Marku, it could very well be that liberalism itself in the Enlightenment tradition is a centuries-long disinformation campaign to discredit monarchy. Now, you, you could make that argument. Um, okay, careful now. <laughs> um, in the end, we, we do have to make a decision, and I mean we collectively as the West, and then I also mean we or you as, as, as members of the European Union or, or, or members of the European community, um, we as NATO, uh, you as Norwegians, uh, and we all, all of us as children of the Enlightenment have to make a decision that there are certain core values that we buy into. And the question came up, you know, what's the role of government, what's the role of civil society? I think the role of government, and because there are no women on this panel, I'm going to go ahead and quote a powerful Baltic woman. Um, First and foremost, the governments should ensure that they have their own strong narrative rooted in values that are understood and appreciated by the citizens, including, for better or worse, free speech. Uh, the minute we go down the road to censorship, that's when we've switched sides. That's when we're doing the work of the other team. Now, is there a possibility of regulation? You mentioned uh, uh, making sure that you identify humans. Really hard to do, probably a good thing, but as Marco pointed out, very difficult. Uh, but outright censorship, you know, I'm, I'm an American, so we just don't do that. Um, it's, it's something you can do in Europe, and we really just can't do it because of our constitution. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, but we have to be extremely, extremely careful, sir. There, there was a time between the end of, of World War II and roughly the, the end of the 1990s where we did have a, a fairly strictly mediated discourse thanks to a few trusted outlets uh, in each country, and in my country especially the three TV networks. Uh, that period of 
about 50 years is short in terms of history. Uh, it could very well be that thanks to our new tools, we are going back to something that resembles more of what the world looked like in earlier periods, uh, where you don't necessarily have a strictly mediated uh, uh, path of influence. Uh, it, in my country, for example, uh, newspapers uh, in the 19th century and in, in, indeed in the 18th century were run by political parties. Uh, and discourse actually looked fairly similar to the way it does today. And I think we, I don't know if we can go back to that window of, of, of strictly mediated discourse. But Marco, I've given you enough time to think, so you can give a better answer. Uh, I, I don't, but well, um, since I, I've been with the media since 1985, uh, well, that might reveal to, to you my age. Sorry for, sorry for this. But well, uh, when you look at, look even, even, let's say, more back in history, when um, the newspapers were founded, I, I can't tell in case of Norway, but in, in case of Finland, in the first newspapers, the language was very wild. And, and uh, I, I would assume that most of the articles, or many of them, published, let's say, early 1900, uh, would not be published today because of the language. And, and if you now look at social media, uh, Facebook has been with us 15 years, 20 years. And, and, and if you, let's say, uh, try to remember when, when was the first time you posted on, on Facebook or on, on Twitter, it's very short time uh, indeed. And I, I would assume that in the next decades to come, we will be more responsible also on, on, social, on social media. We will learn to behave. But before, before we do that, a lot of harm will be done by ourselves and also foreign interferers. Okay, sure. Uh, well, I just wanted uh, to, to go back to one of the slides that was, sh was shown here. 85% of the comments were made by bots. So and that's not free speech. So this is, I think, very, we, sometimes we lo lose uh, this kind of uh, angle that when we talk about the free speech on Facebook, so big percentage is not a free speech. Well, whether it's crime, whether it's influence, how you call it, and we have to fight that. We have, yes, it's very difficult to, to find the, this is the division line and how to, to f identify it, but we clearly have to distinguish these 85% percent is not free speech, is an informational operation to influence our way of life. So, and I think from that angle, we really have a bit less discussion then. Because still, I mean, the, the people, uh, we, we can distinguish even, like if you read the comments uh, uh, under the article, if you look at it critically, I think you can distinguish bots and people. Because usually the normal people, they made an argument and say, okay, I think this is something. And if you read the bot, it tries to impose his opinion on you, always. Because there, in another way, there's no sense for the bot. So I think at some point we would be able to distinguish it uh, and technically, and we have to distinguish the whole notion of a free speech. We for free speech, but we are against for misusing it. Okay, last brief comment, then we have to wrap. Uh, well, um, since I'm from Finland, and, and you might know that the Finnish language is not the easiest one in, in, the, in the world, but it, it has its uh, advantages, I, I can tell you. Uh, Sputnik, uh, that claims to be a uh, news outlet, it's, it's not, it's a uh, means of propaganda, of course. Uh, they uh, opened their news service in, in Finland sometime in 2015, but it survived only about six or seven months and uh, I, I would assume that one, one reason for the short existence was uh, it, it's because it's, it's very difficult and costly business to keep uh, a Finnish language uh, news site updated uh, so that, that, you, you, that it looks like the real one. I, uh, since I, I'm, I'm a native speaker, and even though the articles uh, made by Sputnik were rather nicely written, but you, but you can see as a native speaker that they are not done by a, a Finn. And, and, and uh, that's why I, I think it, uh, it disappeared very soon. And the same might apply to Norway as well, I think. 
Okay, we have to wrap things up, but uh, I have a brief question to the panelists in the end, uh, since the question is how to do cyber defense. Is it possible to turn the challenge of the cyber defense to a success story? Because now we just talked about the problems and the demise of, I don't know, free speech and our civilization and whatever, is, whatever have you. Maybe I'm just colored by my own job, but is this going to end well? Uh, well, the answer is yes, and I could stop here. Uh, but well, uh, um, we learn every day more about it, sure, and there will be a lot of backlashes. We will uh, be beaten up badly uh, because of this cyber, cyber thing. In, in the future, but in the in the end, I'm I'm sure that uh, we will win. Uh, once again, I'd like to quote a powerful Baltic woman: the um, the new uh, uh, head of public diplomacy at the EU delegation in DC was in the audience at a uh, a, a panel at, um, in DC that I chaired, I moderated. Um, and uh, we were talking about countering disinformation, countering disinformation, countering disinformation. Well, she stands up at the end and she says, I'm tired of talking about countering disinformation. How about we talk about broadcasting truth? How about we talk about getting out in front of these disinformation narratives with our own positive narratives that unite us as a, as a continent and as a transatlantic community? Um, uh, how about we use some of their same tools, but not in a, in a harassing way, but in an amplification way for what we truly believe in and what makes our system better? Uh, you know, if we do that, I think we might have a decent chance because in the, in the long run, you know, kleptocratic autocracies are terrible. Well, um, I also would uh, say that uh, I, I see the, the very positive outcome and uh, I mean, uh, we used to see kind of a cyber crime and uh, cyber offense from the other state as kind of a very sophisticated, uh, very uh, well-financed thing, but I mean now countries also very well finance their defense operations and uh, they have a lot of specialists and it, it's becoming very expensive to penetrate the networks to critical infrastructure. Well, it's not bulletproof, but uh, it uh, was, uh, was a time and was the technologies it's getting there. So I myself, I'm, I'm very positive and I think, oh, we have to believe it because if we believe in the state, that state can protect itself. So we have to believe that cyber defense is, is uh, uh, going to win. It does feel better to end on a positive note. So thank you. Uh, thank, and applause to the panelists. Thank you.